f of x plus x to be some new function g of x. Just give me a g of x. Okay. All right. And now I'm going to come up with this iterative algorithm here. So everything on the right-hand side of the equation, I'm going to evaluate at xn. These are the same thing, right? It's just this written, what, x equals xn. Everything on the left-hand side is going to be n plus 1. So the idea here is if I give you an x0, that's your guess. Remember, you have to guess this answer. I give you x0, then you're going to put it through this equation right here. Did you know the function f or triple in function g? You put x0 there and there, you evaluate this, you get an x1. Right? Take that x1, plug it back in, get an x2, keep iterating like that. All right, so uh, equate a point where x equals s that satisfies this equation equals a fixed point. It's called a fixed point, okay? So you understand, <coughs> if I can find a value s that when I plug it in here, I get s back, that's called a fixed point. You see why it's called a fixed point. You should plug it in, it doesn't change. Okay? Um, a fixed point is also a solution of the original equation, right? So if I find a value x equals s that if I plug it in here, I get s back, that's equivalent to finding an s that satisfies the original equation by construction. Okay, now the thing is here, this function is not unique. <coughs> So, like, I could have added 2x onto both sides of the equation. I could have, I, I could have added, I could have, um, well, you'll see. I'll give you some examples. But it's not, it's not unique how you do this. I could take part of the function f and factor it out to get the x. So there's an infinite number of ways to do this is one of the problems, actually. And you'll, I'll show you an example where how you construct this function. If you construct it one way, it works. And if you construct it another way, it doesn't work. But you have no idea ahead of time which way it will work. That's not ideal. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is go through a series of, so that's it, that's, that's the main method right there. I'll go through some examples here. Okay, so this is how it's going to work. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to show you the equation, and then I, I obviously went to the math lab and did all the iteration stuff, right? And I'm just going to show you the answers, okay? So here's an equation. We already know the solution to this equation, right? It's a quadratic equation. There's, there's the answer. There's two of them. Right? That's one solution. That's the other solution. Okay. So now I want to come up with a fixed point. Okay? I want to come up with an iterative equation. Here's one, one of the infinite number of ways to do it. I have this equation equals 0. What I'm going to do is take the 3x and bring it on to the right-hand side, which is this equation. Okay? I just bring the 3x over here. I get this equation. Then I want to get x alone on the left-hand side, so I divide by one-third. That gives me this equation. Let me, maybe I should show the intermediate step. It's not very complex, obviously. But, so I choose to generate the iterative algorithm like this. x squared times 3x plus 1 equals 0. So I write that as 3x x squared plus 1, I write that as x equal 1 third, x squared plus 1. And then I do what I told you I would do before. Everything on the right-hand side of the equation, I'll evaluate at n, and everything on the left, I'll do at n plus 1. So then you get this equation here. And that's what I have written up there, next to right there. That's my function g, OK? So now I'm going to guess the answer. Okay. Because I have to seed the algorithm. I have to have an initial x to run through this thing to get it going. Now obviously for a problem like this, there's, this has no physical basis, this, this guy. Right? I, know, I know the solutions. Right? I could guess one of those and it will work really well. But um, I'm assuming I don't know the solutions at this point. This, this is not a physically based problem, so I really don't know what the solutions might be. Oftentimes you would. So I tried two different guesses here. Okay. And again, to do this, I just wrote a little program in MATLAB to evaluate that function and just did it over and over again. I just did it all command line, actually. It was easy to do. Okay. Right. You can write a function like you can write a function that says x equal one third x squared plus one. You guess at x, you set x equal one, then you run the algorithm, you, run it. you can just run it over and over again in MATLAB. Okay. So if you guess one, it's not too bad, right? You can see it. This is x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. But, I mean, that's actually x8. I skipped ahead. Go 
I ran out of room. You can see I found the solution. And you know, eight, by the time I got eight iterations, I found the four significant digits, that solution there. That's good. It's not that's not bad. Try x equal 3. You know, why did I try x equal 3? Well, I have to admit, I tried x equal 3 because I was looking to find that solution. Right? So I tried x equal 3, and this happened. I hope you understand this is not desirable. All right? So this is divergence, right? It, it, it went the wrong direction. It didn't go towards the solution. It went away from the solution by eight iterations. It was a billion or something. Okay? So it didn't work. So this tells you a valuable lesson about these type of equations that whether it works or not can depend very strongly on your guess. Good guess, good result. Okay. How do you know what a good guess is? You don't. <laughs> so if you're in MATLAB, let's say you, you guess and you, you, it, it fails, the first thing you try as long as it doesn't say you have an error. Like it says you have an error in your code, you fix your code. But if it just says, I failed to find an answer because I diverged or something, then just try to guess. That's, that's the answer. I couldn't, because I played around with this, I couldn't find any guess that ever gave me that answer. You understand? In principle, there's some guesses that'll give me that answer, and there's some guesses that'll give me that answer, in principle. Okay. Guesses that are close to this answer will normally converge there, and guesses that are close to that you would expect to converge there. But I couldn't find any guesses that converge to that solution. Okay. And the other thing is, if you're solving a real problem, which this is not, you don't know how many solutions there are to begin with. Right? So this one I know there's two, so I start looking for them. Right? But if you don't know there's two, what are you looking for? Well, a wise thing to do is just try a bunch of guesses and see if you keep getting the same answer. Like I sometimes will try 10 guesses, kind of spread them around. If I keep getting back that answer, I'm like, seems like there's only one answer. I'm approved now. But it, you know, it's not, it's not bad. If, I, if you get something like this, that's a different story. Okay. So this is a problem, right? Some guesses work. Some guesses don't work, um, and so what should we do? Well, one thing you can do is try a different equation. Try a different algorithm for the same equation, right? Because it's not unique. So now I'm going to do this game, right? Let's see what game I did. Looks like I divided through by x, right? I divided through this equation by x and got this equation here. Then I took those terms, that one and that one, put them on the right-hand side, and then I evaluated everything on the right-hand side at n and everything on the left-hand side by n at n plus 1. So that's a new equation. All right. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to guess the two answers. I switched the order for whatever reason. It was 1 and 3, now it's 3 and 1. This is the one that didn't work before. Right? So now I guess 3 and boom, boom. You know, five iterations, it's found the answer. So now I'm like, okay, now I'd like to find that answer, right? If I couldn't find any initial guess, I could find that answer. It, could, it just went to this answer again. It always worked, but it only found one answer. So you see, this is, this is what you're up against now. Like, in the old world of linear equations, there was one answer, you know, as long as the problem was well posed, there was all, you solve it analytically, right? Find the inverse matrix, find the answer, there it is, there's only one. Now there's no guarantee you'll find the answer, it might diverge, there might be two, but you don't know it, you don't know how to guess. This function is arbitrary. <laughs> okay. So it's not looking as promising as it once was. So it's just more complex. That's the nature of systems being nonlinear. They're harder to solve. Okay? So in this case, reformulate the equation. How did I know to reformulate it like this? I didn't. I just gave it a shot. Okay? And it ended up working out. All right. So this raises the question, like, when do these things work, right? So this is a little bit unsettling if you're like me, because it just says, just hope it works. I'm not a big believer in hope. Okay? I want real results. So, do we have any idea when this works and when it doesn't work? Well, there is, okay, and what I'm going to do is try to explain, so if you go to an applied math text and you see a method, okay, what most folks that are of any quality will try to do is tell you when the method is going to work and when it doesn't work, right? And so to do that, you require certain mathematical tools or a certain way of presenting the idea of when it works and when it doesn't. This is standard way it's done. So I'm going to go through this so that if you were to see something like this in a book, you wouldn't be like terrified. Okay. And I'll try to point out the main things here. So this is an example, and I, I don't know if I got this directly out of the book, I probably did. Um, this is an example of if someone said fixed point algorithm, they said when it worked, it would be called a theorem, right? It would say theorem dot, and then it would give you all the conditions, and then it would give you the results. So this is the kind of thing it would say. Okay. 
it says let x equal g of x. You know what that means? That means it's the kind of equation we have, right? That's the fixed point kind of equation here. Okay. Now it's a fixed point, a solution x equal x. Okay. So in other words, we're going to assume the problem has a solution. That's not very limiting. Right? So in the world of applied math like this, some solution, some requirements are very restrictive and some are not restrictive. I mean, if the problem doesn't have a solution, then you can't expect the algorithm to work. Okay, so this is not restrictive. Assume it has an algorithm. Assume that g of x has a continuous first order derivative. So you know what that means, right? You take the derivative of g with respect to x. That's another function. That function has to be continuous. That's pretty reasonable. Like in most problems that you have in engineering, you can take all the derivatives you want and the derivatives are going to be smooth and continuous. Right? I could come up with some pathological problem that violated this, but it's not usually a problem. So not restrictive. Okay. And the idea here is this is saying these things have to be true. This continuous uh, derivative thing has to be true. It doesn't have to be true everywhere. This has to be true near the solution. That's what this is trying to say. Like the function doesn't have to be, uh, derivative doesn't have to be continuous everywhere. It doesn't have to be continuous near the solution. What does near mean? It's not clear. But not everywhere, right? Because you might have a function that becomes discontinuous like way off at the end of, you know, x very large. And we're not interested in that problem. Okay. All right. So then it says, you have to assume all this stuff is true. And what I'm telling you is nothing here is restricted, so it's fine. Okay. Here's the restrictive part. It says, then the fixed point iteration converges. Okay. And it says, converges for any x naught. That means any guess that is sufficiently close to the solution. That's what that means. Like, it's not guaranteeing you if you guess a long ways from the solution, it's going to work. And it's not telling you how close close it is. Just telling you, if you guess close enough, it's going to work. Okay. Um, and every problem can have a different how close it is. It's just the way it is. All right. Um, and so, so it'll tell you if you guess your answer close enough to the solution, and okay, it's going to work, and it'll converge to the right answer. That's what this thing says. The limit of the sequence is x. So this says it will converge, and it will converge to the right answer. So that's all good, right? But the key thing is this has to be true. You might say, what's that? Um, not sure why you wrote a partial derivative here. You guys have had multi-dimensional calculus, right? It's a function depends on only one variable, so it should just be a dx thing. So what is this saying? It says you take the derivative of your function g with respect to x. You already know that thing's continuous, it has to be. You take the absolute value of that thing, and it has to be less than one, okay, close to the solution. So in other words, the derivative has to not be changing too quickly near the solution. Okay. It's got to be less than or equal to k, which is less than 1. So you can, the k thing has a meaning, which I'll explain here. But, so you're saying the derivative of the function has to be changing somewhat slowly, or at least reasonably slowly, near the solution. If it's changing too quickly, there's no guarantees this is going to work. So you get the idea? So this is the way these theorems work. It tells you all the conditions when this will work. This is not restrictive. This is not restrictive. This is very restrictive. Okay. Many functions aren't nice and uh, slowly changing near the solution. They might be changing a lot during this. You know, so if you had a function, so what this thing is telling you in a sense is that Let's say you had a function y, and it looked like this. Here's x, and you want to know when y equals x. But if you have a problem that looks like this, that's going to be pretty easy to find the answer y, because the derivative is not changing that much. Here's the answer. The answer is right there. But if you have a function that looks like this, that's going to probably have a good chance of diverging. It's all qualitative, but it just gives you some feel for when you get something to make it work. All right, <coughs> and um, this uh, condition here can be equivalently written as this. This is something called a contraction mapping. So the idea here is something like you take two points x and b, okay, you evaluate the difference between x and b, you know, absolute value, and then you take x, plug it in this function, and you plug b in, you plug it in this function. The difference between these two is less than these two. It's contracting. You see, so you take the difference between x and b is greater than the difference between g of x and g and b. It means that the, the 
the space is kind of contracting. It's, a, it's the same meaning as this thing. Okay. All right. And so when people, so somebody, you sometimes will hear, you probably won't hear it a lot, but people will say, you know, this particular function is a contraction mapping. It means this is true. It means this is true. It means it's kind of a nice function. It's nice. It's got nice behavior that looks like this one I showed here, not probably like this one. Okay. All right, and k here is something that tells you the rate of convergence. So you can, you can imagine if k is really close to 1, this might take a long time to converge because you're barely contracting. But if k is really small, you're contracting really fast. Okay. So that's why the value k matters. So you know this guy has a pretty small value of k, and this one has a pretty large value of k. That's probably greater than 1, so it's going to be even more. All right? So when you see results like this, um, you know, this isn't a class and, you know, like we don't prove this or anything like that. We, sh we should kind of look at these kind of things and get some idea of, you know, when they work, when they won't work, work and things like this. So the main thing I would take away from this particular theorem, if you will, is this is going to restrict the applicability of this technique and many functions aren't going to satisfy that. So I wouldn't be at all surprised for a given function if it didn't work because of this requirement. Now, the final caveat here, do you understand, this is, this is a sufficient condition, you know what that means? It means if all these things are true, it will work. It can work if some of these things are not true, just not here. Okay. All right. All right, so with that in mind, let's get away from the theory here and go, go to an example. So here's our redlich long equation. We don't want to leave this untouched, right? There it is, redlich long. We want to have all this information here, pressure, temperature, the gas, gas constant, two gas species dependent constants, A and B. We want to calculate um, D from this, okay? Now what I need to do is write this as an iterative equation. So the first thing I'm going to do in the approach I've taken here is I'm just going, what have I done here? Oh, okay. So I did the following. I took, uh, first, the first step was to take P on the right-hand side of the equation, so that 0 equal minus P plus all this stuff. Okay? Then I added D on the east side of the equation. And then everything on the right-hand side, I evaluated at N. And everything on the left-hand side, I evaluated at N plus 1. So you get what I did there? First of all, you have to form a function that looks like F of V equals 0. To do that, I put P on the right-hand side. Then I added B to both sides of the equation. Then I evaluated the right-hand side every time I saw B and B in, and the left-hand side and B in this one. All right, so there's my iterative equation, right? You guess the value of B, you know all this other stuff. You guess B, you get back at a B in plus one. So will it work? Let's find out. Oh, crap. OK. Um, I already think this. I'm getting it. It's not surprising. All right. Um, so here's argon. It ends up for argon. These are the constants. You can look them up. And let's say we were interested. I got this out of the book, I guess. Here's the conditions we're interested in. So there's the pressure, there's the temperature, there's the appropriate gas constant for the set of units. Okay. Um, so here's an example where if, if someone said, what is the molar volume for this problem? I have to admit, I have no idea. I know it's positive, so I'm not, I'm not going to settle for any negative answers here. But I don't know if it's like 0.1, 1, 10, 100. I have to admit, I don't know until I solve the problem. All right, so I got this iterative equation. Seems sensible enough. Um, tried a couple of guesses, uh, diverged. And it immediately went somewhere bad. Well, this one did. It immediately went negative and kept going. This one went way positive, this one, then it took off. So it didn't work. It, didn't, it did not converge. Okay. And you can see that the reason this, well, you can hypothesize the reason this didn't work is perhaps it didn't satisfy this. And you can change this by how you define your function g, how you make this iterative equation. So I don't remember the next slide, but my guess is I gave it another shot, came up with a new equation. I did. Okay. So let's see what I did for this one. Okay, it looks to me like I multiplied. Okay, so I should, you're gonna have to, you might want to write this down, so I may not know where it came from, and I'm not doing it all on the board, but I can tell you what I did. First thing I did was multiply across the equation by v. Okay? So if you multiply across by v, it puts a v here, it puts a v there, and it cancels the v right there. Okay? So I multiplied across by v. Then I divided the equation by p. Okay? That got rid of the p there, but put a p there, and put a p there. Okay? Now on the left hand side, I have only v, and I evaluate that at n plus 1. On the right hand side, every time I see v, I put v in. 
Okay. So multiply across by B, then divide across by uh, P. All right, now I try the same two answers that I tried before. Uh, our guesses, they're not answers. One and point one. And if I do this, I see one goes to this number. Like, is this number correct? It, it, well, it's a solution, I can tell you that much. Right? You can see it converges. If it converges, it converges kind of quickly, right? So, it came, you know, basically by the second iteration, you're already there. So if you get a solution like this, you're pretty confident this, this is the answer. Okay. I mean, you can always take this answer and plug it back in, but it should work by construction unless you screwed something up. But it's clearly converging. Okay. And then if you guess point one, it also converges to the same answer. Right. And I don't know the nature of this equation, but I'd like to think that, um, that if I put a gas under a certain pressure, there's only one possible molar volume. I hope you'd agree with me on this. Like every time you did an experiment, you got a different molar volume, you got multiples, this would be unusual. So um, I'm pretty happy that there's only one solution, and I'm assuming there should only be one solution, and that's it. Okay? And in the book, that's the solution they get to, so okay. Looks good. Okay. So you can see this is all kind of it's all kind of unpalatable, right? Because I came up with this gas and it didn't work at all. And then I tried this new function and it worked, but I had no I had no way of knowing ahead of time which one was going to work and which one wasn't. Okay, so that's that's not so great. All right, so you can do more than one equation at a time as well. Okay. So I picked this e example up from somewhere. I think the internet or something like that. It's usually where you find strange things. That's where I look as well. All right. So it's two equations and two unknowns. This is my vector function. This is my function f1. And this is my function f2. When you see a bold phase zero, that just means it's a vector of zeros. Okay. Two, you know, it's a zero, zero vector. And so I want to solve these two equations for x1 and x2. Okay. All right. So I'm going to come up with some iterative equation to do it. So let me see how I generated these. Maybe I should write this, this one down. Because I actually don't remember. Let me look real quick and see how I did it. Okay. Yes. Not hard. Pretty darn close. It's like 10% error. You wouldn't really be expected to guess this close in reality. 
uh, do doesn't work, it diverges. So this one, let me see. If you look at these, you can, I guess you, I can see at least, you can see it's oscillating. Like, right? So in this case, I don't know why I keep doing this. Why don't I just leave this on? See, so what happens once I turn it on, then I don't like it, and then I want to turn it off, but it's like, if I just leave it on all the time, it'll be fine. So now what is happening is, it's a different kind of divergence here, but it looks a little something like this. So for example, here's x1, and here's the iteration. What did you initially guess there? 1.1, 1 .1, so I don't know, I guess like here, and then it was, okay, it was zero there. So then it went like this, and then it went like this, then it went like this, and then it went like this. You see, so it's it's oscillating each each time it goes, it's the big magnitude's growing, but it's either positive or negative. So this is also diverging, just diverging like kind of some oscillatory pattern. It's not good though, that's for sure. And um, same thing for um, the x2 variable. You see it's also kind of oscillating around. And I could not find any um, I could not find any equation that worked for this problem. So, I mean, okay, I didn't try every equation possible because there's an infinite number, but I tried lots of different ways of formulating these iterative equations, except for this. I could never get any of them to work unless I guess the answer, right? Okay, so if this was the um, sum total, hey, that's not good. if this was the sum total of solving nonlinear algebra equations, we'd be pretty unsatisfied, I hope, right? So I just told you, um, okay, there's something called the fixed point iteration. Um, there's no unique way to put together the function. There's an infinite way of doing it. There's no way a priori to know if it's going to work, right? And, and if it does work, it depends on the guess. So if it doesn't work, it means you either made a bad guess or you made a bad function. I can't tell you which. You just keep trying, right? But that's not, it's not very systematic. So next time we'll go over um, two other methods, Newton method, which is really very good, and also the secant method, all right? Thank you.